10 years ago, after my gig with consulting, when I was trying to figure out what to do next in my life that can keep me excited and passionate to do what next, a suggestion came from a very comforting source, my wife, who said, follow your heart. And we both knew that there is no perfect time to do the right thing. And we had to jump right in. Trying to figure out in this chaos of you know, what to do, what not to do, where to get into, I found waste management a little more interesting. Two reasons. One, circularity was very impressive. I remembered driving 30 minutes in the city of Houston, trying to take just a few cans of milk cans and then some metal cans, trying to recycle them. And that was exciting as is, and then getting into it and then making the rest of the people and enabling that at scale was very, very exciting. Second, I was getting a chance to speak and work with waste pickers. I had seen my mom work with the needy and derive immense pleasure from it as a nurse in a government hospital. And I thought, maybe this will give me a kick too. Maybe something for us to do. So we dove right in. We landed in India. And then while I was doing this, I spoke to an advisor in India who was a waste management expert. And he said something that stayed with me for a long time. He said, Roshan, in India, there's only waste transportation. There is no waste management. What I realized over the next few months by traveling streets of Hyderabad and speaking to many peers across India is that that's not entirely true. India does an amazing job of managing its waste. And there's a lot we can learn from the Indian system. And what I learned in the next few months has remained a foundation of what I, how I perceive waste management in India as well as in globally. So the first lesson I learned was that there are three types of waste. If you separate your waste or segregate your waste into these three different types, today 70% of global waste management issues can be solved right away. What are the three types? One is an organic waste, which means this is wet waste, which comes from plants and animal sources, except for paper. Now, this waste accounts not a lot to the carbon footprint, but there are re really amazing solutions for this waste. So I and many other entrepreneurs across India have figured out multiple ways to handle this waste, and that's easily handleable. 100% of this waste can be handled if you segregate the waste. And this is not going to be topic of my discussion today. And the second waste is reject waste, which means anything that is sharp, hazardous, that can hurt somebody, or anything that has any body fluids, diapers, sanitary napkins, this is all reject waste. This cannot be managed by anybody, has to be sent to landfills or be burnt. Now, a third type of waste, which is the most debated waste, is the dry waste. This is all paper, plastic, metal, and glass. Anything that doesn't fit into wet or reject category becomes a dry waste. Now, this has a very high carbon footprint and also occupies the most space in your waste. Almost three-fourths of the volume gets occupied by, the, by this dry waste, although it only weighs 30% of the weight. Now, when you look at those mountains of landfills and dump yards, imagine the culprit. And that's the most debated waste, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, the second lesson that I learned is India does a great job of handling its waste and recycling majority of the dry waste. 100% of the metals are recycled in India. 80% of the paper is recycled in India, and remaining 20% gets lost because it's mixed with the waste. And 60 to 70% of glass is recycled in India, and almost 50% of plastic is recycled in India. And that's amazing. It keeps circularity at the core of what India does with its waste. In contrast, if you look at developed world, most developed world, they prioritize burning that waste or landfilling that waste. Therefore, it's all linear. Circularity takes a break. 
most of these countries can take a leaf out of what India does and can incorporate those practices into their waste management practices. Now, you may be wondering, how can India do such a great job despite the size of the country and you also see a lot of waste on the streets of India? How can we be doing a great job of managing our waste? Of course, there's a lot to be desired because of the amount of waste you see on the streets, but still, we do a good job already. Now, that's because of people like Satyama. She's a waste picker. This picture is taken not too far from this place in Hyderabad. There are 1.4 to 5 million waste pickers in India, like Satyama, who come to your home, pick up your waste, go through that muck, and take out all that is valuable. Take out all the plastic bottles and recycle it. These are the masters of enablers of recycling or circularity in India. These are the people who make circularity work in India. But there are a few interesting facts I want to give you. One is glass, which used to be recycled a lot in 2015. Almost 95% of glass used to be recycled. But today, that number has fallen to 60%. Because waste pickers do not find it worth their time to manage glass. The value that glass provides them is much lower. Therefore, it's losing circularity. Second, you see waste picking, even in, waste picking even in developed world. Mostly amongst urban poor. They pick up the waste and mostly recycle the metal cans and they earn money from it. It's true in most of Europe, in North America and so on. Now again, they do not recycle everything. They only recycle that's valuable. So which is telling us that as countries develop and become a little more prosperous, people will find less value in picking this waste. And therefore, more and more materials will lose the circularity and will not be recycled anymore. You may have seen a very hidden um, lesson in this. That's very subtle. I told you that almost 50% of the plastic is recycled. Then, can we look at plastic and only from a circularity point of view, although reduce, reuse is the mantra of whatever your consumption is, just from the circularity point of view, when I look at plastic, there are two major types of plastics. One is good plastic, and the one is bad plastic. Now, anything that has a shape, like a can or a bottle, all plastics are called, in my parlance, good plastic. Of course, only from a circularity point of view. Because they're mostly made from the same material, therefore they can easily be recycled. You can give it to any recycler, or even if you drop it on the streets, it gets picked up by these waste pickers and it gets go to the right, right recycler. Now, whatever you see on the left-hand side, on, the, on your right-hand side, is all flexible plastic, which means these have no shape. Typically, the packaging is done by fusing different types of materials. And therefore, they both have different physical properties and you cannot separate them or can you recycle them because of those differing physical properties. And that's why most of these plastics end up in the landfill and cannot be recycled. This is the plastic that you see lying on the streets of India. This is the plastic that is ending up in the oceans. This is a plastic that gets burnt. And this is a plastic that gets landfilled or dumped. If an entrepreneur manages this plastic, they solve very, very good two problems. One is, of course, it's no more ending up in the environment. Second is, of course, they create an opportunity out of this plastic. Now, that is what we focused on, uh, me and my colleagues focused on managing. Let's look at this bad plastic and make sure that we manage this bad plastic. We worked with a few thousand waste pickers across Hyderabad uh, and in other cities. And then what we did is we wanted to build models so that waste pickers could pick up these bad plastic and give it to us. And we would find a way to monetize it. Waste pickers were finding it exciting because they could earn almost 20% you know, more money in a given day by picking up this type of plastic. Now, we were finding it exciting because this would otherwise would have been environment, and therefore we were trying to bring it out of the environment. So we tried multiple things. We worked with something, an idea called Exonet Producer Responsibility. This is an amazingly well-known idea across Europe and America, uh, Europe, not in America, um, where producer of the plastic pays for collection and re recycling of the plastic. 
fair because they are putting that plastic into the market, so it's their responsibility to take it back. We did initial pilots and we worked quite well, but eventually what we realized is these producers started paying less and less and less and less. Therefore, it was not economically viable anymore to manage it through extended producer responsibility. It also ended up becoming very fraudulent because of that very reason. Now, second, we also worked with entrepreneurs who would make bricks and tiles and you know, anything else from these wastes. It's all innovative, fantastic. Now there also, what we realized is that we cannot make this economically viable. We cannot manage this plastic by being profitable. For every kg of the plastic we managed, we lost money. That wasn't right. That didn't make any business sense. So what we thought was we have to go beyond the material dimension, looking at waste as just a recyclable material, or we have to go look beyond the service where, you know, you give me waste, I'll manage the waste and you pay for it. Doesn't work as well in India. So we had to look beyond that. And that's when the moment of epi epiphany happened to us. Waste is data. If you look at a mountain of waste, it's a treasure trove of data sitting there and telling you what the consumer habits have been, what the consumption patterns of the country are, what their waste habits are. And if you understand the waste, you understand consumer consumption habits. And that data can be immensely useful. It can actually help government build the right policies so that they understand what consumer habits are how consumer habits are changing and how should they be planning towards managing that waste or making sure that they employ right resources at the right places, depending on the waste types. Second, brands can work with data to make sure that their plastic footprint is low, because they understand what's the impact of building those lower carbon footprint packaging, and we can make that happen. Third, they actually can understand their consumers better. Now that can make their marketing budgets much smaller, and can also, produce less waste because they are putting less into the market. Now the fourth is you guys, the consumers. You understand your waste habits and see how can you reduce that waste and how can you be more sustainable. All this is possible without needing, seeing or leveraging any personal information that you have, any personally identifiable information. It's just possible. And this was exciting and the work has been amazingly exciting for me and my colleagues because it ultimately ended up solving a lot of the problems of waste. It formalized waste pickers. They were no more working with the muck, which is all mixed waste, which ends up becoming a reject waste, by the way, and managing that waste, which is very dirty. They were, they were handling much cleaner waste because it was segregated waste. And they felt that they were working with technology because they were working with cell phones and computers and laptops. And the industry, which has been mostly analogish, now had technology intervention, which was much, much overdue. Now, finally, coming back to where I started, both good plastic and bad plastic have a very high value, which is the data value. Therefore, there is no more collection bias. There's no more losing the flexible plastics on the streets and not collecting it. Everything we wanted, be it chips packet, be it chocolate wrapper, be it noodle packet, be it carry bag. We collect that everything and make sure we build data from it so that that creates ultimately 100 times more value than what material creates in itself. And therefore, you're no more, no more talking about non-economical waste management unviable waste management. You're actually talking about managing the waste right way because the data pays for management of the waste. Now, this is even more exciting for somebody like me because when we started initially in, you know, eight to nine years ago, people said amazing things about us. They said, oh, you, you are in the impact space. What you do matters. Uh, you work for the environment. That's fantastic. But none of these sector or generalization or stereotyping helped us. There was no money available. Unless you made money from waste, nobody else was willing to fund this. Therefore, we were not able to scale what we did. Today, 
because we look at ways differently, there is actually a scalable business model which can hit multiple other entrepreneurs and we can make mace management work. Additionally, we hit almost five to seven sustainable development goals, which are very critical to how we see our world tomorrow. So let's all put together and make sure we segregate our waste and ensure innovation becomes key to what we do. And adding value or creation of value becomes very key to, key, key to what we do so that no waste shall go wasted. Thank you.